there's a word, being reciprocal, reciprocity, i.e., I'll share, I'll give you something if you give me something. And sometimes it's not information one way and information the other way. Sometimes you may be sharing friendship, so it's a combination of friendship uh, and information uh, and knowledge, and these things are, are shared. Other, re other reasons why innovation may be a political process is actually projects are linked into our careers. Um, for example, if, if you look at um, product innovation, companies don't innovate and then stop innovating. They innovate a product and then they, they re-innovate it, either as a second version, a third version, a fourth version. And quite often what you see is that people's careers get locked into these innovations. Um, so I was involved in version one of HP Desk, which was a software system. I was also involved in HP Desk 2. So as new versions came along, if, if other products came along, I was going to be more supportive of a, of, a of a product and a technology that had competences or required competences that I had. The other thing that you might want to think about actually is knowledge is contestable. Um, And so when we're making decisions about screening um, and bringing ideas and, uh, to, the, to the table, we have to, we have to remember that not only is knowledge about power, but we may have different views, different notions of what the truth might be, and those might lead us to different decisions about what to do. Um, so all of these, I said I'm not going to go through all, all of them, but you can see here, this is, might be why the process is more political than simply thinking that's a set of stages that we go through. Now one area that I'm starting to do research on, which is very poorly researched, is the notion that innovation is also an emotional process. Um, and you might think that's a bit odd, but actually if you think about the way that you work in your job, um, there are lots of elements in there that actually can be emotional. Frustration is an emotion. Anger is an emotion. Um, joy. Uh, all of these are emotional experiences. And what we see with um, innovation is innovation can be incredibly frustrating at times. It can be incredibly exhilarating if it works, if it's successful. It can be um, full of soul-wrenching disappointments when things don't work or setbacks. If you've been involved in a project for many, many years over many, many versions of that product, when that project is eventually shelved, that can be a very emotional process. And I've heard about um, people talking about almost having a wake um, uh, for, for it. Because if your career is tied up with something for 20 years, you, know, you, you feel almost like you're having a, a, a family loss or something. So the other thing is that Learning, it can be um, a very difficult process. Have you come across the notion of um, single and double loop learning? Yeah, so single loop learning is where you basically react to a problem, yeah? And double loop learning is where you are proactive, right? So in double loop learning, you're proactively questioning your assumptions. Have you ever done that? Apart from it being difficult, it's quite... It's quite... Um, it can be quite emotional because what you're saying is all the things that I know, I'm going to say, I'm going to throw out the window. And that can make you feel very insecure. And if you do that in public, it can make you feel even more insecure. So working in a team where you're saying, well, let's come up with something new. Um, let's throw out our assumptions. People become very scared about talking thing, about making themselves look stupid, showing that they don't know stuff. Um, I think a lot of our a lot of our identity is connected with, with positive things like knowledge rather than a lack of it. So all of these things can be linked to an innovation being an emotional process. So when one is managing innovation, one has to think not just about the different stages and about the rational element of taking an innovation from one stage to the next, but one has to be aware that there are other dimensions that you have to manage. 
I'm not saying that all of these are more important, but they have to be seen um, in light. Uh, the, the innovation process has to be seen in, in light of these kind of elements. Okay, so that's kind of setting the scene. It's an old, have you come across Tom Peters before? He's um, one of these kind of management gurus. A bit, if you come across In Search of Excellence, an old book, but it used to be a classic sort of MBA text, In Search of Excellence. Well, Tom Peters has done one of these similar sorts of books about partly on strategy and partly on innovation. Anyway, this is a quote from him that really captured my imagination a few years ago because it really was where I was coming from, as, as I was saying a few minutes ago. So, unfortunately, most innovation management practice appears to be predicated on the implicit assumption that we can beat the sloppiness out of the process. If only we'd get the plans tidier and the teams better organised, I'll tell you what skunk works are in a minute, the, the role of experience in skunk works, the zeal of champions, all of this is denigrated as an aid fit only for those who aren't smart enough to plan wisely. I would argue it's the other way around. I would argue the poor manager re overly relies on a set of rigid processes. A good manager is one that can embrace um, ambiguity and find a way of moving forward. So this is what I think the problem of a lot of the NPD lit literature is it's trying to get rid of the sloppiness. I would say the sloppiness allows you the the room and the space to be creative and innovative. And therefore, a good manager should find a way to allow that to happen. So this is my starting point, really. It's the degree to how far you take that. I'm going to give you four examples. You, won't, you probably don't know who this person is. No? <laughs> this is called someone called Graham... Obrey, he's a Scotsman, hence the Flying Scotsman. Has anyone seen the film The Flying Scotsman? No. Um, I interviewed this chap quite a few years ago, um, very interesting bloke, and it, I, I was on a plane just a couple of years ago, and I, put, I noticed this film, and I realised it was about him. Um, he's interesting because he came up with a very innovative um, way of riding. but he also changed his bicycle. But more importantly, I don't know a lot about cycling, and I'm not sure if you know much about cycling, but in the cycling world, they have something called the hour record. And in the hour record, basically you've got to ride as far as you can. And the people who've had this, the people who've actually had the hour record are the cycling greats, Eddie Merckx, people like that. So people who have won the Tour de France and, and, and been incredibly um, successful cyclists are those that are normally on this. Um, it's like winning the World Cup. Um, so, you know, you go down history by getting the world, the hour record. So you'd normally associate very, very famous, very, very successful riders. Well, Aubrey was a nobody, basically. Um, cycling... I don't know how much you know about the culture of cycling, but cycling is very much linked to France, Italy, um, and there's a great deal of elitism about it. England is um, on the outside of that elite. And Aubrey, being in Scotland, in a tiny little village, was outside of that. So he was about two or three steps away from um, the institutions of... Um, cycling that made the rules and regulations for cycling. I'll come to back to why that matters in a minute. So basically this cyclist um, modified his bike in several ways. Oh, he changed the way he rode. Yeah. Um, in fact, he did have another one called Superman. Um, but he changed the way he, he had the handlebars. He, he also moved the... Um, the pedals closer together to give him more leverage, and there's a few other modifications. In fact, what's famous about the, um, the pedal bit is it came from 
the part actually came from a washing machine that he, he took apart. So basically he did this with no budget because he's, he was basically unemployed. Um, he worked, I mean he was obviously an incredibly fit cyclist. So he did um, uh, a lot of cycling, and he, but he modified his bicycle. Anyway, not only did he get the hour record, he actually got it twice. Yeah, so he got it, and then someone called Chris Boardman, who's another British cyclist, got it, and then he got it back. Um, so an incredible feat for basically an outsider. However, you can imagine an outsider winning the hour record doesn't look too good for the elite establishment of cycling. So basically, he became ostracized, his innovations became banned, and he was thrown out into the, into the wilderness from where he came. Um, and it's, it's actually a very interesting story. But what the message of this story actually is, how do organizations and companies who are very set in their ways embrace outsiders? Okay. Now, He's essentially a deviant, but he's largely he's an outsider. And so organizations need to find ways of, of, of tapping into or connecting to those outsiders. Because clearly this, this chap was incredibly innovative and was incredibly successful. The way the institution of cycling operated in Europe was they, they decided to push him away. Yeah. So that's a kind of analogy for how innovation can happen. Oh, is it? There's, there's man, yeah. Oh, okay. There's, there's, a, mm, there's sure. a wetsuit, not, not the one that um, Phelps wears. There's another wetsuit that's supposed to be I'm very innovative and, yeah. and so on. And I'm not the sure about Ms. Chevron's who, who got it. But that is banned because they're arguing that it gives you too much of an advantage. Mm. Well, it's interesting <laughs> because when you look at his cycle, I've got some other photos I won't show you now, but basically, it was interesting that it was with him they decided that the changes had come too far because there had already been other changes. For example, Boardman had a, a wheel that was solid, which you've probably exactly. seen. Now that gives you a huge aerodynamic advantage. So it was interesting they were decided that his innovations had gone too far and not Chris Boardman. Now Chris Boardman is actually, um, he was uh, very prominent in British cycling and therefore he wasn't someone that they, they could push aside, whereas he was. Mm. Yeah. So, how do we embrace the outsiders? <laughs> the second is successful innovation through deviance. You may not know this, but, well, you would probably heard, you probably not, <laughs> you may not recognize this, but you surely have, <laughs> I'm old enough to remember this. In fact, my, 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 um, my first degree was, um, business and computer science. And I, I did, um, my, my, for my final year undergraduate project, I did a dissertation where I had to do some software. And it, it makes this look like rocket science. <laughs> I had, um, oh, it wasn't a ZX81, it was a, a Commodore or something. Anyway, um, you, but you've all heard of the Apple Mac. And, we've, um, and the Apple Mac was a hugely successful innovation. But you might be surprised to know that the formal project was the Apple Lisa. Has anyone heard of the Apple Lisa? No. no. You're not meant to say yes, you meant to say no. <laughs> yeah. You're already, yeah. The Apple Lisa um, it did sell and did get to the marketplace, but this, this was the formal project that, um, that Apple had. This project emerged from what was called a skunk, a skunk works. And a skunk works is a project that emerges outside of the radar of management, if you like. So this happens in spite of management, not because of management. And what, what it basically did was to, um, they found ways of getting resource, um, and they basically produced the prototype product. Is that the story is a bit more in, de in depth than that, but essentially this was the formal project, this was something that emerged behind the scenes, and eventually, as we all know, even though some of you have heard Lisa, <laughs> um, this was the